I was thinking about what to give this message a title. You probably noticed I don't title a lot of my messages. I have a title for every message. I don't always tell you what the title is. They're usually, uh, I don't know if you've learned about me. I'm not the most creative person uh, in the room. But uh, so I thought about titling this, uh, this message, The Burning Bush. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, I've seen some lessons entitled The Call of Moses. Uh, in, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, maybe we could title it An Introduction to God. We learn one of the names of God. Uh, so you pick one of those, and that's what we'll call it uh, this morning. Uh, but we're going to start by reading a few verses that we, that we finished with last week in Exodus chapter 2, the last uh, three chapter, or excuse me, three verses of that chapter. But let me pray first, and then uh, we'll read the word together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ministry of the choir, for the way that they uh, point us towards you. Uh, They help us to consider who you are and what you're like and how you interact with us. Lord, I pray that as we look in your word this morning, we would have a better understanding of who you are and our tendencies and how we respond to you, uh, that we might be used of you to do mighty things. And I pray these in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read Exodus chapter 2, verses, uh, starting verse 23. And these are the last few verses we read. It sets the stage for uh, chapter 3 that we'll look at today. So during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel... And God knew. So the people of Israel were living in Egypt. They were being oppressed. They were uh, in slavery to Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt. Uh, and they were, they were desperate. They were being mistreated. And so uh, they cried out to God. God heard their cry. He remembered his promises. He saw their situation. And he knew what needed to be done. And so that's what, we're, 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 what we'll look at this morning in chapter 3. What's, what will God uh, do about their situation? One thing that I want us to know, uh, you just look for it this morning, and we'll talk more about it next week. God's response to the situation in Egypt was not because he wanted to punish the evil of the Egyptians, which certainly happened, but God took action because he, had, he desired to rescue a people that were in great need. Uh, So you look for that in the text this morning. We'll talk a little bit more about it next week. So Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now Moses, and remember Moses, we talked about him last week. He grew up in in, uh, the household of Pharaoh, essentially the king of Egypt. When, When we say Pharaoh, we're not saying somebody's name. We're saying somebody's title. So in our English, it would be more appropriate to say he grew up in the household of the Pharaoh or the king, or the president, the ruler of the land. Uh, and so he, for 40 years he lived there, then he, then he killed an Egyptian, and he fled to the desert, and for 40 years he lived in the desert. Uh, keeping, keeping sheep, he, he found a wife, he, was, he had a family, and here we are in verse 1 of chapter 3. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned." When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. God said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Moses said, excuse me, God continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So Moses is tending sheep. This was his occupation. He was a shepherd. The text actually says he wasn't keeping his own sheep. He was keeping sheep for his father-in-law. He worked for his father-in-law. And it says he was near Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Another name for Mount Horeb would be Mount Sinai. 
uh, which of course is where the law is given in, in, uh, in, in the chapters to come. And so Moses is, is out tending the sheep, uh, and verse 2 says, the angel of the Lord. And uh, we were actually talking about this in, a, in another context on Wednesday night with when the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua. Um, but here, uh, we see that it is the angel of the Lord that appears. So angel is a Hebrew word for messenger. So we could read this that the, me the messenger of the Lord appeared, or the angel of the Lord. And so sometimes in the Old Testament, uh, angels are referred to, sometimes it is an angel that is referred to, and sometimes it is the angel that is referred to. And um, on, on Wednesday night, uh, Tom made a good uh, observation that when you see the article, the, in front of angel, that we are, uh, we're talking about uh, a, a manifestation of God Himself on earth. So it's not just uh, an angel, but when it says the angel, uh, we're talking about the all-powerful, unseen God taking a form in a tangible way to interact with man on earth. And I think as we go through this passage, we'll see uh, some pretty good evidence of that. So the, the angel appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a burning bush. The bush was burning, but it was not consumed. So, you know, if you were driving down the road and you saw something on fire, we, most of us, we'd, we, we kind of, you know, we look and we're trying to see what's going on as we go by. Well, Moses wasn't moving very quickly. He was tending sheep, sheep that were wandering, sheep that were meandering, sheep that were grazing. And so he's probably looking at this bush for a while before he thought to himself, well, one, probably just thinking, why is there one bush on fire? We're not talking about a wildland fire. We're talking about one bush that was on fire. And then, as he watched this bush, he thought to himself, like, is somebody stoking the fire? You know, there's no gas furnaces, gas appliances. You know, you turn it on and leave it. You had to tend to a fire if it was going to burn. And so there's this fire or this bush that was burning. And uh, Moses is curious. And so verse 3 says, uh, from the text that we read, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. That just, I, I just smile when I see this. You know, you see something, I will turn aside. You ever speak to yourself that way? <laughs> I will get up now and get dressed. <laughs> Anyways, that's what Moses said. He wants to get a closer look. And verse 4 says, now remember it said, the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses. Now it just says, the Lord saw that he turned aside, and God called to him. The angel of the Lord, the Lord, and God, all being referred to as the same person. So this is actually God himself speaking to Moses. And you'll notice in your Bible, uh, verse 4, when the Lord, Lord is capitalized, capital O, capital, excuse me, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Uh, pretty much universal in every, in every Bible. It's like that. We're going to talk about that in a minute, why it is that way. So the Lord, uh, the Lord, the God, called out to him, and God said to him, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The ground is holy, God said. The ground is set apart. This ground is distinct. What makes a place Holy. What, what sets a place apart? What makes a place distinct? It's not the location, it's the presence of God. God was there in that spot, and so it was a holy place. Verse 6, we get uh, further identification. And so, out of the burning bush, God said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so we've been talking about what that means, why God identifies himself in that way, and how did God uh, reveal himself to these patriarchs? He revealed himself as El Elyon, which is, come on, God Most High. He referred to himself as El Shaddai, 
God Almighty and, you guys know this one, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. These are the ways that God revealed himself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So this is the, this is the identification that God gives to Moses. So Moses knows that this is the God of his fathers. This is the creator of the world. And so Moses rightly hides his face, recognizing he is not worthy to look at God face to face. He humbled himself before God. Continue in verse 7. This is what the Lord had to say to him. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This is good news for Moses, right? He's on the run. He can't go back to his people because of the murder he committed. He knows their oppression, and so this is good news for Moses. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Good news. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, to the Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, but I will be with you. And this will be the, sh the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So God tells Moses, I've seen the affliction of the people. I have seen the oppression of the people. I've seen what the Egyptians are doing. I've heard their cry. Uh, and now it's time to do something. I haven't forgotten my promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And we're going to bring the people out of the land of Egypt to this place that I have promised. And verse 10 just seems very casual. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm going to bring the people out of Egypt, and I want you to go to the Pharaoh to tell him. He's just wandering around in the desert, taking care of the sheep, <laughs> you know, minding his own business. And God appears to him in a bush. What if, what if you got a voicemail when you left this morning, left here this morning? You got a voicemail, and the voicemail said, hey, this is God calling. I'm going to do a great work in Ukraine. <laughs> I'm going to withdraw the Russian troops, and I'd like you to go tell Putin that it's about to happen. <laughs> this is the magnitude, this is the magnitude of, the, of the, the call that Moses is getting. And God identifies himself with the children of Israel. He says, you will bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So Moses has at least five objections to this request, understandably so. Verse 11, we already read, Moses says, who am I? Who am I to do this? Who am I to go before the Pharaoh? The, the, in, the, in the Egyptian culture, they worshiped many gods. Uh, the most powerful uh, probably being the sun god, Ra. And uh, Ra, the sun god, had a son, and he would send his son to the earth to uh, uh, keep everything in order on earth for him. His son's name was the Pharaoh. So in addition to the sun god, Ra, they had hundreds, literally hundreds of gods. And, and God says to Moses, I want you to be my representative in front of the Pharaoh. Moses says, who am I? P perhaps le legitimate. He's 80 years old. He's been on the run for 40 years. He's wanted for murder. But notice what God said to him. 
Moses says, who am I? God said, I will be with you. It's almost as if Moses' question is not, even, not relevant in any way. God says, what does it matter who you are? God doesn't even address it. Moses says, what's, what's my credentials? How do I know that I'll be successful? Why am I the one that you're choosing? And God says, who are you? What does it matter? I will be with you. That's all you need to know. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you're up against or what you have to deal with. God says, I will be with you. The New Testament echoes that promises to followers of God, followers of Christ, that he will be with us. So that's excuse number one. Who am I? It doesn't matter. So then Moses says in, uh, in the next verses, well, who are you? You're going to be with me. Who are you? So let's read it together. Verse 13, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? The Egyptians had hundreds of names for gods. And they, so what if the Israelites want to know his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said, this, also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and, I am thus, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So what am I going to tell them if they ask me what your name is? Maybe we would ask the same question. And God answers him, I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent me. This has always been a, like a bit of a difficult passage for me. Like I, for, for me, it feels like this is, this is going to be the big reveal. How is Moses and how are the people of God to refer to their God? And God says, I am. So I am is a, uh, a variation of the Hebrew ver verb to be. Could also be translated, I will be who I will be. And I'm thinking, still not helpful. So I, I read one commentator who described this name of God as a poetic description of the nature of God. So that was very helpful. Because I thought, okay, it's poetry. I'm not going to get it. I need someone to explain it to me. So Moses asked, who are you? And God said, I am who I am. Perhaps if Moses had asked for more clarification, which he doesn't in this text, God would have told him, I am the one who creates. I am the one who provides. I am the one who sustains. I am the powerful one. I am the one who always was. I am the one who is. I am the one who always will be. But God does go a step further and gives a name to Moses that's not immediately evident in our English translation. Verse 14, God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has sent me. This is my name forever. Well, did you see the name in there? So in English, we don't see it right away, but the name is the Lord. So when we read in our English translation, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all caps, we are reading the name of God that God gave to Moses here at the burning bush. So in the, in the Hebrew scripture, this was written Y-H-W-H and pronounced Adonai. 
A little confusing, isn't it? Okay, just quickly, uh, because like I say, just trust me on it, but I'll give you this short explanation, which will really just mean you're going to have to go look at it later. So the Hebrew language was written without vowels. So to, so to see in the written text why HWH was not unusual. That's why they had priests and they had Levites, because they would be able to read this, this uh, Hebrew language with no vowels. They would know the pronunciation. Well, eventually, uh, vowels were added to the, to the Hebrew language to make it easier for everyone to read, except for this word. It continued to be translated Y-H-W-H because uh, the Hebrews revered God so much. The Jewish, to, to, till today, they do not want to mispronounce the name of God so they don't say it. And so, uh, because the vowels were not added, and because uh, Jewish people would not even speak the name of God in fear of mispronouncing it, we don't know how it was pronounced. Uh, so they would say Adonai, which is a Hebrew word for Lord, uh, when they would read the scriptures. So when they were reading the scriptures, they would say Lord. They, they knew they were saying the uh, they were using that as a replacement word for this name of God that they didn't want to misspeak. And so uh, the English translation has LORD capitalized, all caps, so that we're not confusing uh, b between God and a human Lord or a human master or a human ruler, which is also described sometimes in the Bible. Uh, so... Um, our English word for Y-H-W-H is Yahweh. Uh, and so that's how someone at some time decided to uh, translate it to add vowels and give a pronunciation to it. Sometimes you'll also uh, hear the word Jehovah. It was, in, it was in one of our choir songs. In Latin, there's, uh, there, there wasn't really a Y. They used a J for the same sound. And instead of adding two vowels, they added three vowels, and they got Jehovah. So Jehovah... Yahweh, or Lord, all caps, this is the name of God that God gave to Moses. So Yahweh means the all-sufficient one, or the self-existing one, uh, the one who doesn't need anyone for life. In fact, the, it's the one who gives life, and the one who sustains life. This is the God, the name of God that God revealed to Moses. God is. He's not becoming, he's not developing. We become, we develop as we grow. God isn't becoming, God isn't developing. He is who he was, who he always has been, and who he always will be. So Moses had several other objections. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, Moses said to God, Well, what if they don't believe me or listen to my voice? They're going to say to me, God didn't appear to you. The Lord, Yahweh, didn't appear to you. What if they don't believe me or if they don't listen to me? And you can read through this. We're, we're, we're not reading you know, uh, verse by verse. You can read through it. God essentially says to them, uh, says to Moses, let me give you some signs. And he turned his staff into a snake uh, and turned it back to a staff. He made Moses' hand uh, uh, full of leprosy and then healed it. And he said, when you take water out of the Nile, I'll turn it to blood. God said to Moses, it's not you who they need to believe. It's me that they need to believe. They need to believe in my power, not in your ability. In Exodus 4, verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not eloquent. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and of tongue. I don't speak very good, Moses said. I'm not really good with my words. I won't know what to say, and, and, and if I do, it won't come out right. He could have said, I'm not smart enough. He, he could have said, I'm not old enough. I, he could have said, I'm not strong enough. I, I, I lack the physical traits and abilities to do this task that you're asking me to do. Of course, God responded graciously. Who made your mouth, Moses? 
Did I not make your mouth? Am I not able to give you words? You need to go, and I will give you the words to speak and the ability to speak them. Essentially, that was God's response to Moses. So here we, here we get to the bottom line in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Moses replied to God, please, Lord, send someone else. This is the bottom line. God said to, Mo- to Moses, you're going to go to the Pharaoh, and you're going to speak for me and let him know what I am about to do. And Moses said, I don't want to go. Send somebody else. He just doesn't want to do it. He said a lot of things. Well, who am I? I I'm, not, I'm not qualified. Who are you, God? Can you really be trusted? Well, I, I, don't, I don't speak well. I don't have the necessary, I don't have the experience, I don't have the training, I don't have the vocabulary, I don't have the, the, the presence. Well, they won't believe what I said. And God's answers were, I'll be with you. I'm the one that's going to do this great work. I will give you the, sp- the words to speak. It'll be done with my power, with my ability, by my provision. And it's really interesting to me, God never wavers in the conversation. When you read back through it, look at it, he always says, I will, and you will. Moses had plenty of excuses. God had one option. Moses, you're going to do this. And of course, God sends his brother uh, Aaron, and he said, I'll send your brother. You'll speak to Aaron. Aaron will speak to Pharaoh, and I'll do the work. So a a couple of observations from, from this passage this morning. We need to be honest with ourselves with each other, and with God. I mean, isn't, isn't this a real conversation between Moses and God? I hope you can identify with this conversation, either with the, the one doing the asking or the one making up the excuses, right? Don't we, don't we tell people what we think they want to hear? Or what, they, or what we think will be an appropriate response instead of just telling them what we really think? Moses had, gave four excuses before he was really honest and said, I, I just don't want to do it. Wouldn't it be better if we were honest with ourselves, with each other, and with God? God, I don't want to do it. God can, God can work with you on that. Another interesting thing from the passage, God never affirmed Moses' training or experience. You know, last week I highlighted, man, this is the perfect guy for the job. He grew up in the Pharaoh's house. He knows how to conduct himself in the Pharaoh's court. And then he lives in the wilderness for 40 years, navigating difficult terrain, Tending sheep, moving from location. This is the perfect guy for the job. And God never once said to him, Moses, you're ready for this. Moses, you know how to speak because you lived in Pharaoh's court. Moses, you know this terrain. You're going to be ready to lead the people once you... He never said that one time. He said, I'll be with you. I'll, I'll show you the way. I'll provide when you need to be provided for, and I'll give you the words to speak. God said to Moses, it's not about you. This is about me and what I'm doing. So the third thing is that, uh, which I've just been referring to, success would depend on God, not on Moses. Isn't that a comforting thought? You know, whether, whether you're signing up to... Uh, help with the blessings meal, or you say, well, I'll, I'll help give out toys this year, or I'll work across the street and, and minister to people in need in that way. 
I'll teach a Sunday school class. Maybe just speak up in Sunday school class. Offer some input. Success depends on God, not on us. God, would, God is with us. He's the one with the power. He's with the one with the words. He gives us help in our time of need. As you know from the... Uh, number of announcements that we've been giving out in these last few weeks, there is a lot going on around here at House of Prayer. There's two main reasons why we do things, uh, I, I feel like, here. One is equip, to, equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what we're here on Sunday morning for. It's why we do Sunday school. It's why we do Bible studies. It's why there's small groups. To prepare ourselves for the work that God has through understanding His Word and encouraging one another. But then the other is to engage. Engage those who are lost and don't know the gospel. Engage those who uh, maybe are wandering. Engage with those who are hurting. Engage with those who are in need. Everyone equipped, everyone engaged. And we have, a, we have our, our own list of excuses of, of why we're not able to be a part. And maybe we need to be honest with ourselves and honest with God. And maybe it's not about not having time. Maybe it's not about having the resources. Maybe it's not about uh, uh, having understanding. Maybe it's not about our, our level of eloquence. But maybe sometimes we just say, I don't want to. I'd rather, you know, be hunting or fishing or watching football or visiting with friends or whatever it is that, that we fill our time with. God has an agenda, and his plan will not be thwarted. So the question is, are we going to join him in what he's doing? He invites us to be a part. Will we have excuses like Moses, or will we get on board and say, yeah, I'm willing to do something. When, when, I, when the Lord presented himself to Isaiah uh, through a vision of heaven and said, who will go for me? Who will I send? And what, did, what was Isaiah's response? He had no excuses. Here I am. Send me. Let's all find something that God's doing and get involved with it. Everyone's, everyone equipped. The most, the most uh, equipping thing about a follower of Christ has nothing to do with whether you've been in church or how many Sunday school classes you've been to or how many. We have the Holy Spirit within us. His power is within us, and he wants to use us for his glory. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for your son. I'm thankful for the, for the new life that you've given us. We're, we've been looking at the people of Israel, and uh, they are in a desperate situation in need of salvation. And that was, uh, that, that's the plight of every human being in a desperate situation in need of rescue. And when we call out to you, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, you rescue us. And you don't rescue us just so that we can uh, uh, live a, a, a lavish life of luxury. You rescue us so that we can represent you here on this earth. And Lord, thank you for the many opportunities that you give us to serve you. Lord, thank you for this passage in that when you called Moses, uh, you also uh, revealed yourself to him as the, the sustaining God. You always have been, you always will be. You are what we need. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Lord, I pray that we would have confidence to do the things that you're calling us to do. You call each of us to different tasks. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful, that we would be found willing to do the things that you have for us, not full of excuses in the way that Moses was. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an exciting morning this morning as we uh, conclude the service uh, with baptism. And so I invite uh, Eric to come forward and Adrenel. She's coming. Okay.
Pastor Peter's coming as well. And uh, mom's coming as well. Casey uh, Faulkner's coming. So uh, come on up to the, to the front. And uh, when we baptize here at House of Prayer, we baptize because Jesus' command was to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Eric and Adrenel have professed faith in Christ, and they want to be obedient and follow Him in baptism, just as Jesus commanded. So we're going to... Casey, do you want to come up? Yeah, come on up. So we'll start with, uh, with Adrenal and Pastor Peter. Right this way, sweetie. You want to do it with the shoes on or the shoes off, Adrenal? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to take this over here. Well, good morning, church. Uh, I'm so excited to get to do this with y'all and, and Miss Casey. And can I actually have, they're a large group, but can I have the Faulkners that are present just stand up real quick so we can see which parts of the family are here? There they are. Hey, guys, can we give them a welcome this morning? Good to see you. That is awesome. How's the water feel? Warm? Get your head up high so they can see you. There you go. This is Adrenelle Faulkner, and she has uh, come forward, and we had a wonderful conversation, me and her mom, with her about her professing faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I can only imagine, I'm not a parent yet, but I can only imagine how exciting that is for them uh, and how cool that is for you, Adrenelle, to show all these people of your profession of faith. And I looked up, and there was this really... I was left with a a lasting uh, thought as you left, and that was that you were of great kindness. And I know maybe you guys wouldn't say that, but I I didn't have, I don't have the knowledge of living with Adrenelle. So I was like, yeah, she was so kind. And this is a scripture that speaks of God's kindness. And it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, that is in the person of Jesus. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit that he poured out. And I just, I was left with this lasting image of kindness from you. And that is a kindness I believe that Jesus gave you, Adrenal. So is it your profession of faith? Is it your choice to uh, follow Jesus in believer's baptism this morning? I like it. Very good. Well, in that case, here, you can grab my arm. You want to hold your nose? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, how about that? Eric. We've got all these. Uh, oh, I told you it was going to be warm. <laughs> Good. All right, this is Eric Smart. His wife, uh, Caroline's in the front row, and the family's here with him today. And uh, Eric, we've been talking about Moses, and Moses was a strong man, but ultimately his strength came from the Lord. And so my encouragement to you this morning uh, is to be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And Eric, I I see a strength within you, but I also want to encourage you 
to rely ultimately on God for your strength. Eric has professed his faith in in Jesus Christ, and so Eric, I have a question for you. Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And Eric, would you like to be baptized today following the Lord in obedience? Yes. All right. Eric, upon your profession of faith and in front of these witnesses, I baptize you in the name of the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. That's the end of our service. Adrenal is here. Eric is here. Uh, I know you can't all come up and congratulate them, but as, uh, as many of you that can, uh, encourage them in the Lord this morning as they have taken this step of obedience. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you that we can celebrate new life that you give us. Uh, and, and we just celebrate this morning with the obedience of Adrenal and of Eric as they wanted to make a public declaration this morning that they have put their faith and trust in you and they are seeking to live their life according to your word. Thank you for them in their testimony this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Come see Eric and Adrenal. If you have any other concerns, prayer requests, I'd like to talk to an elder or one of their wives. They'll be at the front as well.